If you are in house, you're welcome as well. Uh, the resident pastor of the house, Pastor Sunday Adu, and the assistant pastor, they are away on mission. Well, on the line of the ministry work. And a good number of people in the house, away for today. So I stand in as the assistant pastor to minister to you today. It is a honor to also have an amidst as well, even though he has been announced, for those of us who are online and who are also just coming in, we have the superintendent or the general overseer of Gospel Faith Mission Worldwide in our midst today. Shall we rise up to our feet so we can give him a befitting welcome? Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, sir. You can have your seat. This month, We've been dwelling on dwelling in the secret place. Today is the last Sunday of the month of April 2023. And each month we have an inspirational or inspired theme through the man of God, a general overseer, that is given worldwide as an anchor, a monthly anchor to work on. So in the last few weeks, on this pulpit have come ministers to minister to us on abiding or dwelling in the secret place. And today I'm just going to continue on that theme, on that theme. Dwelling in the secret place. Let's bow down our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks because you have not left us in the dark. Your word is life. And that life is our light. Your word enter into the prophet and he stood on his feet. We ask this morning that your word will enter into us all again and stand us on his feet, on your on our feet to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Theme dwelling in the secret place. And I chose a special topic that is a little bit different, but as it's tied into dwelling in the secret place. And the topic today is your story is glory. Now I want to stand here and uh, mention my offense and my apology to the AV department. They didn't get much of this ahead in time. So I'm going to work with you. So please work, work with me. I'm going to be very slow and patient as I call the verses so you can put it up as well. I know you had a very, very short time to work on this. My text is taken from Psalm 91 verse 1 and Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 23. We'll give a little time so we all can open it. And I want us to actually read it together. I don't want to forget the way I actually prefer to minister, and that's to engage you. So I'm going to be asking the ushers and a few ones to please get a few microphones, because I'm going to be talking to you in different aisles. So... uh we're all going to be engaged in some way, so uh, I can take you through my thoughts. Psalm 91 verse 1, and I'm reading from King James Version. He that dwell in the secret place of the Most High 
shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 23. Luke 16, 19 to 23. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, meaning at the rich man's gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now, I want you to follow this very, very carefully. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Many times, when I hear or read this passage, it's evangelistic in nature. And this is a passage we used to preach about heaven or hell. And may I say something to us, especially if you are online and you are joining us for the first time. We believe that the word of God the Bible is the word of God from Genesis to Revelation. Absolute word of God from Genesis to Revelation. You cannot engage unless you believe that. And that's what faith is all about. A lot of people ask for proofs. But I say to you, when God drops his spirit in you, it's not about proof. If you are asking for proof, you'll never be a believer. And that's what faith is all about. It's not about proof. A young man was here, I believe last year, part of the came with someone on invitation with the chosen generation. And I sat down with him. Much of what he was asking was about proof. Proof to me. Proof to me. Show me this. I'm a scientist. And I said to him, I cannot convince you. I don't engage to proof to people. I can only pray that God will open your eyes. Now, that's about the entire scriptures. But when you look at the words of Jesus, even though it's the same in the scriptures, but it's not that it was God's words that was inspired and people wrote down as they were inspired. No, 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 no. These were things coming out directly from his mouth. And I've learned something as a practice. In the New Testament, you will see the writers or the printer will print it in red. I pause and I say, Lord, give me understanding. Don't get me wrong. When you read every part of the scriptures, you ask for understanding. Every part of the scripture is the word of God. Don't get me wrong. But specifically, when it's coming out of the mouth of the Lord, it's not a second-hand story. Are you with me? It's not an inspired to a third writer. We just read Isaiah this morning. That was a prophet. 
Okay, but this is different. These are direct words from the Lord. And I want to prepare you about the passage we have just read. The second thing is, Jesus many times spoke in parables. When you look at this Luke chapter 16, it did not say that he said a parable to them likewise. No, 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 no. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was a parable. But I didn't read it in the scripture that it was a parable. It was telling a vivid story, not a parable. So, let's engage. Let's engage. The first part I want us to look at is the beggar. He said there was a certain beggar. From where you have read, I'm going to focus on this side first. So, uh, you just raise up your hand and they'll bring the microphone to you. The same thing will go here, the same thing will go here, so you better wake up. My My first question is this. As we've read the story, at the end of it, where was this beggar? Anybody on this side? Where was this beggar? What did the Bible say about where he was at the end of his story? He was with the Lord in uh, Abraham's bosom. Okay. He was in Abraham's bosom. Thank you very much. He was in Abraham's bosom. Don't go too far. Second row. What does that mean to you? What does that mean? Abraham's bosom. What does that mean? Anyone? If they don't, then we can go to the third row. In in heaven with the Lord. Thank you. In heaven. When I read this too, that's the interpretation I got that it was in heaven. Abraham's bosom meant heaven here. Now, the third row now. For him to have been in Abraham's bosom or to have been in heaven, what does that tell you about him? Anybody on this side? Let's make it quick. I know chosen general. This side are full of smart people. We're, we're all smart. <laughs> yes. That he had a relationship with God. That he had a relationship with God. Wonderful. Wonderful. I want to hear from another person there. And put it in a different way. It means that he lived rightly. He lived. He lived, righteous, he, he lived, lived rightly. Okay, he lived righteously. Would it be right for me? You just answer me if yes or no. That this beggar was a believer, right? Okay, very good. He was a believer. Here are the questions that I'm presenting to you. Jesus did not describe him as a believer. How did he describe him? A beggar. A beggar. Now my first question is, well, not my first, I've been asking several questions to this side. Is it, is it conceivable that a believer could be a beggar? You know, uh, we've, well, I won't go into several scriptures that we know. In our today's age, in a modern way of looking at things, we, we look at being a believer, you can't, it's, it, it's, you can't be poor. It, it, it's, it's not the real thing to be poor. Especially when we are in an age where we talk about prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. I know that's not new, and I'm not against prosperity. Please don't get me wrong. I want to prosper. I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy, so don't get me wrong. But here is a believer. Excuse me, so I don't lose my... Here is a believer... Who is a pauper, was was very, very poor. 
And I asked myself that question as well. Somebody said yes there, but that's not a common question for Christians today to answer yes to. To be a believer, and yet it was very, very poor. Here's the second thing about this believer. You know, when you are poor, not many people want to associate with you. When you have something to give to people, oh, you will have a lot of friends. When you don't have, not too many people. Here's the second thing about this believer. He was very, very sick. This believer was very, very sick. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we go forward, let me come to the second row. In Psalm 38 or Psalm 37, I have been young and now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor the children begging bread. Oh, you are even quoting it for me. Thank you. Is there a possibility that some people look at this man and say, no, this cannot be. This is what the scripture says. I have, it's, you can't see the children of the righteous, much less or much more, whichever way you look at it, the righteous begging bread. But here he was, begging bread. Does it mean that the scriptures contradict itself? Absolutely not. If you look at the topic I gave you today, I said, your story, God's glory. That's the thing. If I miss that, you might want to take a note of that quickly. Your story, your individual story, God's glory. He was sick. That's the second characteristic. He was very, very sick. The Bible says that he was full of sores. And let me tell you about sores. I know there are a good number of Healthcare workers, doctors, nurse practitioners, and nurses here. So I have to be very, very careful so I don't say it wrong. One of the things you learn in nursing and medical school is uh, a course we call pathophysiology, meaning the process of diseases what happens in the body about diseases. And one of the things we learn is when you see sore, many times there are symptoms of something. Am I right about that? If you are, where is uh, Sister Omonai? Am I right about that? Okay, the mask is on. Sister Amosha, am I right about that? Can you give them speakers so they can? Uh, because people online, they can hear you. When you have source, there's some underlying things about that source, right? Absolutely. Okay. Abs oh, she even said absolutely. Absolutely. These are things we call signs and symptoms. When you see something on a person's body, like the Bible calls it source here. It means to me, we don't know his illness. We don't know what was wrong with him. But apparently, there was something more than this source that was going on here. The outward manifestation of his illness was just the source that were all over his body. Could he be diabetic? Could he be a stage four or end stage cancer? Could he have had some disease that doctors even did not understand or have cure for? These are possibilities. So are we saying that you can be a believer and have cancer? You can be a believer and be diabetic? You can be a believer and have heart disease? You can be a believer and have some incurable disease. It seems to me, even though 
I'll quote another scripture for you. I am the Lord that he let thee. Not if you obey me. If you believe me, none of these diseases. But it appears to me that Lazarus was a believer. As we have just said. But yet, even though he says none, none of these diseases, he had a disease. May God help us to get through what I want to share with you. In his illness, did you know Lazarus could not walk? He wasn't able to walk. Somebody said, yes. How did I know that? Because they carried him, yes. They used to bring him every day, not that he came by himself. And the people who brought him did not stay with him. They just brought him and they just leave him at the gate of the rich man. Let me speed up a little bit. Things that I won't be able to say this morning, I believe the Lord will minister it to you. Three, he was completely destitute. He had nobody with him. We don't know the people who brought him, whether they were his family or his friends, but at least they were good enough to bring him. But nobody stayed with him. Let me tell you how I knew. I wanted to ask that, but I'm looking at the time we have here. The dogs came to lick his wound. If somebody had been with him, what do you think they would have done? Chase the dog is away. Yeah. Then it was so bad for Lazarus, a believer. That even when dogs came, there was nobody to help him. And I put here, he had to have been a man who lived in pain. He had to have been a man who did not see himself fit. If he came to church like this, maybe some of us would not even sit beside him. He wouldn't be the well-dressed person. He didn't, if you look at the parking lot, there are a lot of cars there. That means many of us here, almost all of us here, we live above Lazarus. He did not have the means we have. Let's just shorten it here so we don't go on and on. The law will interpret many things to your mind. A believer who on the last day we saw where he was, he tells me something that to this man, it was not so much about what was going on in its, in its outward body. It was not so much about the people around him. Let me ask one more. Was it possible that Lazarus was praying and praying either to be healed for his condition to be changed? Possibly. Possibly. I don't think he would be a believer and he would just be quiet. He probably had been praying. And... I don't know where you are. Maybe you are online and you are listening to me. And in your situation, yes, you have been praying and people have been praying for you. And the situation has not changed a bit. And I'm here to say this to you. That there are some things that you and I do not understand. One of the things we know is that your story, my story, or it can only be for one thing, God's glory. The focus of Lazarus, he had a few things that I learned from him. He, he, he was a believer that did not care about everything that, yes, if he had them, fine. If he did not have them, fine. The most important thing to him was what? What was inward? You know, this is a month of dwelling 
in the secret place. Many people might not even know that he was a believer in his state. They just saw him as a beggar. They saw him as a beggar. So, in a secret place, oh, he had to have been a man who was determined regardless of what it was. What is more important to him was that treasure that he had inside him. Even though he was poor on the outside, but on the inside him lies what? Treasure. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, chapter 4 rather, and I'm going to quickly read verses 4, verses 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 to 10. The apostle wrote, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God. That's God's glory. And not of us. We are troubled on every side. I know believers who were married and not a child. And for years they prayed and prayed and people prayed for them and quoted scriptures. Yes, not a child. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And I believe that this was exactly the heart and soul of Lazarus. And I believe personally I'm resolved in this. That my heart and soul will be about the treasure inside. Let me look at another letter of Paul. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. For I am persuaded. Romans chapter 8, 38 to 39. That neither death. <laughs> Dick and Omana, are you there? <laughs> he and I spoke about death several months ago. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Things present are those you see in Lazarus. Nothing's present, nothing's to come, no height, no depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you this. This man was not leaving one church to another, going from pillar to post, finding solution to his problem from one prophet to one priest to one pastor prayer to the no, 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 no. He didn't say because, well, there was a family here many years ago that left us. They left us of hope. And they left us off because what they were waiting for before the Lord, they did not get it. Therefore, they left and went somewhere else. Not Lazarus. Not Lazarus. And I want to challenge you today to look at what your faith is. Some people came to Jesus because of the bread, because of the prosperity. Because of what they could get. Are you there? And there's something you are going through? I don't know. I'm not, please, please. I'm not taking any case I know or your story to use you to preach a sermon this morning. No. 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 As a matter of fact, 
No, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna share that with you. Okay. This much of a sermon that I was just called upon to come and minister this morning. So it wasn't something that I spent a long time preparing for. So if you feel that you are there, is this man talking about me? No. No. I want you to look. Don't, don't worry so much about the state of your body. Don't worry so much. Keep one focus. Your life in the secret place. Where you are by the treasure on the inside of you. I'm going to quickly go quickly to the rich man. The rich man. The man, the Bible described him as a rich man. Here are some things I wrote now. He was very, very wealthy. He was famous. I'm not preaching about heaven and hell this morning. You know that. He was very, very wealthy. For him to be mentioned to be dressed in purple every day and be so elegant, in today's age, he had to be a celebrity. If you mention his name, everybody will know him. You know, there are some names. If you mention them, you don't need to describe anybody. Let's try. Trump. Wealthy, rich man. Bloomberg. Yes. For those of you who are from Nigeria, Dangote. You don't need a first name. Zuckerberg. You don't need Gates. They were very, these are wealthy people that you really don't need to give a nation or first name. The name just stand out. And I believe that's probably about this man. He was elegant and expensive in his dressing. He, was, he had to have been a powerful man in his community. He was well connected and he had a household name. Here is my question to you, to the entire congregation now. What was this man's name? Okay, okay. I will answer that question for you. I will answer that. The Bible never mentioned his name. I don't know his name. And I want you to listen to me carefully if you're online as well. Here is what I perceived. Jesus did not know his name. Well, he knows all things. Don't get me wrong. God knew his name. But God did not know his name. It means this to me. If your name is not written in his book, he doesn't know you. It doesn't matter how wealthy you might be a household. I just mentioned a few names to you here. That when you mention that name, oh yes, everybody knows it. But here, as rich as he was, as, as rich as he was, as wealthy and connected as he was, in heaven, before God, he did not have any name. Why? Because there was not a secret place for him. There was nothing inside. But there was a whole lot on the outside. And I want you to look at this. We're going to round up soon. If you are there online and if you are here, within the house even though many times when we look at this passage that we just read I said to you it's usually an evangelistic passage it's used when we are preaching the gospel 
But in this month of dwelling in the secret place, something dropped in my spirit to share another perspective about what Jesus was saying here. Not only to people who have not heard before, but for many of us who have seen this and read this, what is your state? What is my state? What is more important to you? What is more important to me? Is there something you are going through and you have been praying and you have been praying and you have been praying and it's not changed? The first time they told you, yes, it was stage one cancer. By the time you went back a few months later, they said, oh, it's stage four. As a matter of fact, they now pushed you into palliative care that, yes, this is, this is the end. Or you are there and you are in, you've been married and you've been praying and praying. I'm not saying that you will not have a child. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying to you that your illness will not be healed. I'm not saying to you that you are meant to be poor. I'm not an anti-prosperity gospel. No, no. I'm just telling you the other side of things about God that we do not know. So when you do not know, stay put where you are and make sure that what is inside is more important. The psalmist said, I would rather die a pauper. I would rather be the poorest man either in the palace, in the kingdom, than to be the most wealthiest man living in the palace. And if there's something about you, let me add this to it. So you know that God, his plan for us is that of good and not of evil. You may have heard me say this before. So you know that it's not about where you are now or what's going on with you now. Moses was 40 years old. He was 40 years old. He came on his scene. There were two children of Israel having a feud, having a fight. He said to them, you are brothers, don't be fighting. You know what one of them said? I know we're believers, we've read that and I walked through the Bible. One of them answered him and said, who has made you a judge over us? He knew the sin or the guilt of Moses, what Moses had done, that Moses had murdered somebody the previous day or on the previous occasion. So based on what he knew of day of Moses, he said, who has made you a ruler over us? Did you know that that man's statement even though he was meant to deride Moses and Moses got scared by it. Did you know he was being prophetic? 40 years later, listen, 40 years later, did Moses not come back to be a ruler over them? Yes. 40 years later, I look at the life of Moses in the segment of 40s, in three segments. The first 40 years, the second 40 years, and the last 40 years. The first 40 years, it was not, that man saw him with something negative about him. 40 years after, not four days, not four hours, a whole 40 years after. He came back. If that man 
who saw him and accused him and said, as God who has made you a judge over us, if he was still alive and he saw him and he recognized Moses, you know what would click in his mind? This same man that I accused or thought or challenged as having authority or ruler over us, wow, is here now as a judge over us. Here's what I'm saying. Two things I'm going to mention to you. What God has in stock for you, the plan of God for your life, your story, Many times you have no idea, but certainly there's God's glory in it. It did not just come by accident that Moses became a judge over them. If you look at Psalm 104, yeah, Psalm 104 or Psalm 103, somewhere there, the psalmist said he made his ways known unto Moses. And his acts to the children of Israel. What changed Moses from where he was to somebody coming back to be a judge over them was the secret place. Where others did not know, he allowed God to make his ways known to him. And he submitted himself to those ways. Are you with me? Let's rise up to our feet. Whether you're here with me or you are online, I want you to take about two minutes and I want you to have a talk with God. I want you to have a talk with God. The song that is flowing in my mind The preacher Len Maggie is an Australian. Please remain in prayer. You know I'm not a good singer, but I'm just going to sing the chorus very, very unusual. Online, in-house. You've got to make up your mind. 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 Heavenly Father, we just want to bless your name. We believe you are the author and the finisher of our faith. Whatever it is, that you meant for each of us this morning in a different state. Our beloved Reverend Plummer says something. He said, God will not take me here to this point and leave me. And I believe as well that you will not take us to this point this morning and leave us. We ask, as we asked in the beginning, with all thanksgiving, that you minister life to your people. That would change 
everything and keep us permanent in your secret place. Thank you, gracious God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have your seat. Have your seat.